here at the Society stage and a big thank you to uh, Emily O'Reilly and to Fionn Sheehan for that very engaging talk. Uh, we're now going to come to an issue that is pretty much the issue of our day. Um, it's of our time. Uh, over the past year, Europe has seen hundreds of thousands of people cross its borders. There's been countless images of refugees fleeing from countries where terror and violence reign, and in particular Syria over the past year, um, probably coming to a head with the image of Elan Kurdu, the small child on the beach. Um, so we're here to discuss what technology can do in assisting refugees and migrants, and beyond that push for better and stronger and faster in technology, we want to see and discuss how technology can fundamentally improve human welfare and specifically assist people migrating. And I've got three panelists here with me today. We have Paula Schwartz, who's the co-founder of Startup Boat, who uh, focus on developing innovative solutions for the social challenge of migration. Mike Butcher here on my left, who is editor-at-large uh, from TechCrunch and the founder and initiator of TechFugees and Chris Fabian, who is the co-head of innovation at UNICEF. So thank you all for joining us. I want to start, really, you know, there are a lot of different ways that technology can be leveraged and for different, for different people, for the refugees themselves, obviously for NGOs and aid organizations and for policymakers, and we may touch on some of those today. Um, Paula, you're based in Berlin, but you have a connection with the Greek island of Samos, and your connection with that island where thousands of refugees have landed and are still landing brought you into this sort of area of looking at migration. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and Startup Boat and how that came out of it? Sure. So um, I spent my summers as a child uh, between Greece and Turkey at the border region, actually. And um, we were already seeing a lot of people coming um, over the last years. And <clears throat> this year, actually, for the first time, um, we had uh, the amount of people, the number of people increasing dramatically. Um, I had built up the um, Venture Bus in Africa together with some people beforehand um, in, in uh, Kenya, and I thought that it was interesting to focus on building up solutions quickly um, with few people involved, with a lot of technology involved, and to also give them the possibility to um, function in a financially self-sustainable way. So I thought that um, it would be interesting to bring together people um, to the border region between Greece and Turkey and focus on uh, social challenges and develop solutions um, that can also be financially self-sustainable, that can grow fast with a few people involved and that work over a number of regions. And uh, that's actually how the idea of Startup Boat came about. Um, and uh, since we're focusing on two, two um, crises in Greece at the moment, one is the economic and one is the migration crisis, um, it specifically made sense to do it now um, as the needs are only increasing. Chris, um, UNICEF is at the center of humanitarian aid in many different countries. What services do you feel that people who are refugees or perhaps migrants need, what services do they need supported and how does UNICEF go about supplying those? Yeah. I mean, I think everybody needs the same set of services, whether you're a refugee or you're living in New York City, you need access to information to get around your day-to-day -day life, you need some access to opportunity, and then you need an ability to make choices. And whether we are looking at a refugee camp in, in Jordan or looking at this, the migrant crisis in Europe right now, what we do see is that the world has changed. There are almost 60 million people who are displaced today, and that's not going to change. It's not going to get to be a smaller number anytime soon. And so when we're looking at somebody who doesn't have a state, who's in between states, um, we, we try to find out how we can work with them to create those same sets of access that we might take for granted. Um, and we've seen that in the most difficult environments, in a refugee camp or, or on a trail between two places, people are able to come up with their own solutions much more articulately than anybody is from outside. And so what we try to do is look at how we can help, uh, in many of the same ways, kind of help build up those solutions that are developed locally and then scale them to other contexts. Mm. Paula, you're, uh, you set up First Contact, which allows, um, if you could tell us a little bit about it, but I suppose how, how technology is playing a part in the migrants journey at the moment and what first contact does for them when they arrive so the mobile phone of a, a refugee is the one thing that he holds on to with his life um, because it's the only way he can or she can communicate with uh, the people that these um, people come leave behind so uh, it's interesting to see that 
everyone who arrives in Greece, at least, still has battery on their phones. The first thing that they ask for is Wi-Fi. Then when you provide a hotspot, for example, they immediately go on WhatsApp, they um, call their friends and family to say that they actually survived. And it's an interesting situation because for us, we think um, they're in, um, in a super shitty place in the moment that they arrive, but for them, it actually means that they're on safe land and they, they got to Europe and um, they're super happy in exactly that moment. So, um, why the phone represents a way to move forward as well. Uh, yes, exactly. So we've had also contact with um, with an app that's called Cartero. That's an open app solution where people actually put in routes um, that you can um, take to come to Europe. And they've had half a million users in one week now from Iraq, which is insane. And uh, what happened with First Contact is that we built an information website um, for people who first arrive in Europe to better find police stations, to find hospitals, to book ferries, to um, do the currency exchange, um, yeah, to basically find out you know, how from the Turkish lira you can um, convert to, uh, to the euro, things like these, also with um, hotels, because many of the refugees are financially stable. Um, they just are not allowed to book a hotel or they're not allowed to access a supermarket. So we provide information about when you're allowed to do that and which processes you have to go through in order to reach that point. And in the first 10 days, we had 8,000 users between Greece and Turkey for that website. Then we ran the second startup boat to Lesbos. We grew the, the first contact website to that island. Um, and now we're producing um, hardware that can be used together with this, um, this information website to link helpers and refugees more effectively. So the idea is that you have gadgets that say first contact, supporter, and um, then people recognize you because it also says it in Arab and in Farsi, and they can directly come up to you. You have guidelines on the website that show you how you're meant to deal with the people who just arrived. And uh, we set up migration hubs. This is what uh, Mike and I were talking about before the panel um, to work on these solutions further. So we're bringing in people to the border regions, um, entrepreneurs who say, yes, I want to dedicate some time and I want to um, yeah, use my knowledge to really make a difference and go back and test the tools that I'm working um, on. And yeah. Speaking of you know, using your own knowledge, and you, you, Mike, you are a magazine editor. What brought you into this sort of migration dialogue? Why did you feel that it's something that you could contribute to? Um, well, is this thing working? Yeah. So um, obviously I'm best known for being uh, tech crunch, covering startups and VC and stuff like that. People with a lot of money rather than people with no money at all. Um, and, uh, but I was just sort of frustrated that there didn't seem to be kind of any kind of coherent technology community response to the crisis. Um, uh, it, admittedly, there are kind of existing organizations, and I think what, what we wanted to do with Tech Fugees, which is a stupid name, and people, some people hate it and some people don't, <laughs> I don't know. Frankly, I don't give a damn about what the name is. The, the question is whether or not technology people c could actually have any effect on this crisis. And we've heard earlier, you know, from people like Paula and, and Chris, like, that technology can bring um, interesting and disruptive kinds of um, uh, yeah, products to the issue. Now, we're not saying this is a magic bullet. We're not saying this is going to solve the crisis. We're not going to say, say it's going to bring peace in Syria. But, we, we, but there are things that you can do. So, for instance, uh, Paula just mentioned Cartero. Um, one of the interesting things is there is data coming out about how the smuggling operations work. And actually, if you think about it like a technology, it's a bit weird, a bit glib, but just think, go with it, me on a journey for a second. Is that If you think about the amount of data there is about migration routes, for instance, that's data which technology people are used to dealing with all the time. We're used to dealing with big data sets and turning things into APIs and turning things into products. And there are ways of doing things like, you know, for instance, you could disrupt people smuggling networks by putting information into the hands directly of refugees about how to uh, uh, legitimately access European countries. So, for instance, there's a startup now called Migrate, M-I-Great, G-R-E-A-T, dot com, and they have come up with a product. They originally had a product around 
legitimate migration, how do you apply for visas and things like that. And they have now also produced another product because of the crisis, which allows people to very quickly pass information about where they apply, who they talk to, uh, and things like that. UNHCR now has a fantastic uh, website. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I apologize, I can't remember the URL right now, about apl legitimately applying. So going through all of these, you know, uh, uh, these kinds of processes. And, and there are lots of things to, do, to be done. We, and what the thing TechFugees did was basically just say, let's do something under this banner. And what's been fantastic for me is we started off with a Facebook group. 48 hours later, we had 2,000 members. Everybody wanted to get involved. We did a conference in London and a hackathon. And now we've had a, com a hackathon in Oslo. There'll be one in Warsaw. We're planning one in Beirut. And it's actually about the technology community sort of going, this is our problem as well. We can get involved and we can legitimately get involved with uh, uh, charities and NGOs on the ground in our country. And one of the lovely things that came actually out, out of the Oslo hackathon was how concerned people were about refugees arriving in a country and then trying to integrate and becoming that sort of, a, you know, kind of weird uh, halfway house between refugee and then asylum seeker and then perhaps citizen. And how do you integrate into the community and educate children and, you know, how do people get jobs and things like that. And that was, you know, a wonderful thing. I, I just think it's a, been a wonderful experience about how we can basically bring our technology skills to this problem, you know, super quickly. Paul, do you want to come in there? Uh, yeah, what I wanted to add to that is that um, the people who come here already are entrepreneurs, right? So, uh, you know, they take their faith into their own hands or they get on their feet and they start walking for 10 days or for two weeks. Um, they spend huge amounts of money and they already are entrepreneurs. So uh, we have to include them, um, refugees who come and are incredibly capable and all they want to do is work. Um, and in Germany, for example, we have a difficult situation because they're not allowed to work, but sometimes, but they can really begin to um, build up their own lives again as entrepreneurs and engage in the community, be part of a new welcoming society. One of the things you've got to remember is that Syria was actually a very developed uh, yeah. Middle Eastern economy. Um, huge levels of education, huge levels of edu university educated le people. And uh, so we're not, um, we're not just talking about some sort of, some, uh, sort of backwater or here. This was a developed society. They're, I mean, they're not yeah. economic migrants, let's be serious. They're refugees, they're fleeing, they had yeah. jobs, they had, uh, you yeah. know, homes and they communities. They leave because their home is bombed, actually. Yeah, exactly. But so I mean, they're, they're moving across borders. And uh, can I just come back to TechFugees for a minute? What challenges did you set down to the experts that you got together? And, and, and have you come up with any solutions? Um, well, yes. The... It's very early days, but you know what tech people are like. You give them a product and they start, you know, mapping out Trello boards and stuff like that. It's fantastic. I mean, and so for instance, some of the products were like, um, how, do, how do you build uh, safe areas inside refugee camps for women? Uh, uh, there was one called gcycle.org where it, anyone could take their smartphone and recycle it to a refugee via an NGO. Uh, the, some of the stuff that would come out in, in Oslo were about um, doing mobile apps around education. Um, uh, one of the biggest issues is Arabic. So um, is being able to translate things, apps and platforms into Arabic so they, they are accessible. Um, there's been lots of sort of open source stuff going on around um, sort of kind of PDF pamphlets and, you know, for new migrants. Um, yeah, um, Ruth, just about you, anything you can imagine. You've worked on the ground in, uh, in a number of Af African countries, and Mike is talking there about some of the hardware and software that we might be able to bring to people. Uh, what have you learned in uh, various countries in Africa that you've worked in, particularly in the recent Ebola crisis, that you can bring to this crisis that might be transferable? Yeah, I mean, I think Mike raises two really interesting points about how the world has changed recently. One is that you've got these big tech companies and small tech companies who are really interested and understand that there's this global system around them that they can be part of and want to help in an emergency. And sometimes that help is really helpful and sometimes it's not so helpful. And one thing we've seen is that there are a set of principles that we can start to pull out of what hasn't worked that let us work better with tech companies. So for example, 
um, in the Ebola crisis, there was a whole urge and, and, and a sense from Silicon Valley that the best thing to do is to take smartphones and put apps on them in Silicon Valley and send them to West Africa. Uh, and that's, that was a terrible idea for, for many reasons. One of them was that if it's not built locally, it probably doesn't work locally. The second is that you have companies and shops selling phones in Liberia. And then the third one was that the, the data networks weren't working and basic 2G and some 3G maybe were. So for a whole set of reasons, we needed to figure out how to develop solutions locally. And the idea of having this kind of external brain working on an internal problem just wasn't very symmetrical. And we've, UNICEF has developed with UNHCR, USAID, and others a set of principles of innovation, and you can Google that, that are sort of nine things that we look at when, when some, somebody comes to us and says, I've got some great technology for a crisis. But the other thing that you bring up, and, and I think that we're seeing a lot now, is that suddenly you can help somebody, and, and a refugee in one part of the world can help a refugee in another, right? A kid who's having one set of problems is probably pretty connected to a kid who's having a, a similar problem somewhere else. And we saw something very interesting happen recently in our innovation lab in Kosovo, um, which was that we had a whole bunch of young programmers who UNICEF had trained in open source technology start to build systems for kids in Lebanon, um, kids in the, in the sort of Lebanese refugee uh, diaspora. And what we saw was that we could actually start to connect problem solvers, and this is very much what the Facebook group started to do. Mm -hmm. You can connect problem solvers, and our value as UNICEF is much less about bringing a solution and being like, here's something I developed in New York, and much more about creating these connections that let people work authentically together. And that's a very different attitude towards emergency response, I think, than like, let's just ship some of our brain out. Mm. Yeah, this is one of the things that came out of TechVGs, is we really wanted to design things that were basically spoken to us by actual refugees, rather than taking it as read that we had all the answers, you know, in our sort of, you know, sort of West London developed society or whatever, um, that, that uh, you, you did actually have to, you know, user-centered design, the principles of user-centered design have to be applied to these things, definitely. And, and, and the Arabic's is not a problem if, you, if, you're, if it's an Arabic speaker who's building the app from the beginning. Mm. And what we saw in, in the Ebola crisis very clear, clearly, we have a system called U-Report, which is an open source system for text messaging and, and aggregating polls of kids. And when we tried to write messages to Liberian kids in my old American English, it was, we got zero responses. When you have a bunch of young people design those questions, design those interactions who are Liberian youth, you suddenly start getting 20% response and rates. What, do you, what are you using your report for? So right now, you, we've got about 60,000 U reporters in Liberia, all over the country, and we can ask them any, any question we want. We, it, it started as an Ebola thing. Now we asked them last week about sexual violence in schools, and we said, are you seeing any sex for grades in your school? And of 60,000 people, we got about 20% responses, 83% of them saying yes. In their school, a teacher was asking for sex for grades. And our role as UNICEF is, again, to be that interlocutor, to connect them to information sources in the government, to a helpline. And we said, here's a phone number you can call. They all started calling it. It crashed. The, the, you know, it's a traditional old-style helpline. That crashed within five minutes. We worked to build up another set of helplines. And then we worked with the government to start putting in the legislative mechanisms to respond to this huge crisis. And that all happened in a matter of weeks, two weeks. And, and something like you report, sorry, I'll come to you in a second, Paul, something like you report, how do you think that could be transferable to the crisis that we're seeing in Europe at the moment? I think it goes back to exactly what everybody said on this panel, that you need access to information first about what's happening, then some options and some ability to do something with that information. And I think that whether it's you report, which is an open source system that we built, or WhatsApp, which isn't, I mean, it doesn't really, I'm less concerned about the platform itself and more that this methodology can allow people to connect to each other and help solve their own problems, and we can sort of be that broker. Um, and I think, again, that's a sort of different approach to solving this stuff. Paula, tell me about the, uh, the migration hubs that you're building at the moment, um, and, and how they function, and, and what, uh, how they're going to support migrants. Well, migration hubs are um, idea labs, really, where different um, challenges are a showcase that people are dealing with around Europe, because um, really the, the um, things that you see um, that are the biggest problems in Germany, for example, are different from the ones in Greece. Greece is a transition country, and Germany is more a country where people want to stay, right? So um, in the migration hubs, we bring people together across Europe to work on different tools and to really exchange information, and particularly on Samos and on Lesbos, where we're going to bring entrepreneurs to, who want to spend some time to develop these tools. Um, they will keep on working with the local communities, with refugees, uh, to find out if you know, they're on the right track or not, and spend some time there exactly to develop tools that don't go you know, um, away from what they're actually meant to be doing. 
And I think what's really important to note is also that we have to act now. So um, it's solutions that have to um, function very quickly because things like the winter is coming, right? And we looked into something like the winterization kit that was developed on the second startup boat where you have a sleeping bag, you have thermal underwear, you have a thermal bottle, a hat, gloves, and theoretically you could give that to people on their way to Europe. It sounds ridiculous, but it's actually something that um, is very usable for many people. So I think this is also something that we have to regard, that solutions have to be applicable in many situations quickly. So we need blueprints of stuff that just works for problems that you face in France and maybe also in Greece. And you make people um, able to use it quickly and to build the solution. I well, think that's what we should go for. One of the areas that I, I think is important to discuss is when people are moving across borders, obviously they don't uh, bring necessarily a passport with them, they don't have documentation, they don't seem yeah. to have any identity. Yeah. What is the next leap forward in technology that might be able well, to this is, assist this migrants? This is actually very interesting and there are now projects out there to, um, for instance, supply refugees with um, blockchain linked identities. Uh, if you can imagine a scenario where you're you basically throwing away your... Um, one of the biggest issues is, is uh, refugees who are educated and who have you know, degrees or whatever, they lose all of their documentation, whether they're robbed or it's lost, and they can't prove what they're capable of in their arriving country. Um, imagine scenarios where you could keep all of that documentation in the cloud, um, and, and that's, some of them are actually doing that, obviously, um, but imagine setting up facilities for that to be um, ratified by European universities, for but instance. But for that, we need or more support from the public sector. Exactly. In Greece, for example, well, it's, it's very, awful. It's, the but whole I think that a situation is very movable, and we're incredibly... We're all very new to this. But here's something interesting about that, right? So <clears throat> a third of kids in the world don't have a birth certificate. They don't have an identity anyway. A third of children, that means that if you don't have a birth certificate, you don't get access to basic services, to health, et cetera. If there's an emergency, you're the most likely to be trafficked. Um, so in, in a sudden onset disaster like the tsunami in Indonesia, the child trafficking planes arrive before UN planes or humanitarian planes. They're there first. They're these very sophisticated networks of people who will move other people around and sell them. Um, and if you don't have an identity, you're most susceptible to that sort of stuff. However, Facebook, Google, the internets know exactly who you are all the time, right? So there's an area where private sector and tech, th that you, the same pair of shoes that I look at on one website follows me around in a really creepy way for days, right? So there's a persistent identity there that I didn't create that was created by the data that I generate. And somewhere there's a space for us to actually, I'm not gonna say skip the public sector, but I don't know, skip the public sector and look at how we can work with technologists to figure out what that persistent identity is and what the traces are that you can help somebody have but that give them a job. But it is super intransparent. I mean, two things. For example, people don't want to register in Greece because if you, if you go to another country afterwards, you're always sent back, which is very bad because many people have to go to the hospitals and they just keep going, right? And, you know, and when Greece, you has, Greece has a few issues of its own right now. Yeah, that's one problem. And the second thing is that the European Union now set up these hotspots for people to register and they're offline. I don't know if you heard about that. It's a registration centers. Well, there's no centralization and then. So it's they're not on the internet. And they're not even on the internet. You know, it's just a branding sort of... Pol well, I, I think what you're talking about, Chris, is some sort of self... And Mike is, is some sort of self-sovereign digital yeah. identity. And But there are problems with that. So if you're a child that has come across a border on your own and you have no identity as such, who initiates that identity and how can technology help that? So you're, I mean, in that particular case, there are systems. The UN has family tracing and reunification systems to reconnect a young person with their family. And that's an established international sort of framework for yeah. finding somebody who is lost, asking them a set of questions, and in a safe manner. And that's led by UNHCR, UNICEF in some places, and Save the Children. So the, there's sort of an international framework on that particular issue of, like, here's a 12-year-old, how do you connect them? But, I mean, the other question is, if you have something like education, which is a great example, we got really tripped up in the early days of the sort of Syrian refugee outflux in, uh, in, in Lebanon and elsewhere, because everybody was like, well, how do we make sure that these kids have a Syrian diploma or a Syrian degree from whatever temporary school they're going to in Jordan or Lebanon? Mm. And it's like, it doesn't matter, guys. They're, they're not going back. These kids don't need a Syrian 
degree, I think. They don't need an, a certification from Syria. They need to get schooling that can give them a job in three or four years. And I think that, that it goes to that question of moving quickly. We can either get caught in figuring out all of the frameworks that we need to work within for identity, or we can figure out what is exactly that people need and how do we give them those services quickly. And the only way to do that is to work with them directly. And but the tech community has been amazing with that, right? So there's the first digital university for migrants that we had on the first startup boat, and they developed an infrastructure for people to take mock exams while they're actually also on the road. And then theoretically on their third year at this online university, they could go to a campus and really register when they get to their exams. So it's amazing what people have been trying to do. And I think, you know, the, the technology community is incredibly generous and really is very much about problem solving. And just at the basic level, you know, if you're in a tech company and you hear about a refugee, well, you know, you can work with them online, get them to do some designs for your logos or whatever, you know. We, Pay them we, in Bitcoin. We, right, yeah. I mean, we, um, uh, we did, um, we've, We've sent some laptops over to a refugee camp in Turkey so a couple of web designers can do some freelancing and make some money, right? And, uh, and just feed their families. And I think we, we can all get involved in this, even if it's the most basic human level. We don't necessarily have to come up with, you know, new, whole new apps and platforms. We can also do things ourselves personally. The I'm just going to have to stop you there. I'm yeah. afraid we've come to the end of our discussion, but I think that we have shown that the tech community can respond and uh, change how we're changing things, I guess. Mm. Um, and I think that one of the keys to maybe a successful methodology that we've been talking about is part of your innovation strategy is to have open source. And I think to... That was going to be my last pitch. Uh, there you go. Open source uh, technology that everyone can access. Um, and, and work on, and also perhaps sort of remove the individuals from it, uh, that it is a, a non-ego-driven effort. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Mike Butcher and Chris Fabian and Paula Schwartz for joining us here today, and thank you all for joining us here at the Society State. Thanks, guys.